Live and uh, on the broadcast show today, you if you catch the broadcast show, you would have seen or will see um, a gentleman named Jay, Jay Richards. He's an economics guy, a professor, and uh, we're going to talk to him a little bit because I'm getting in a little bit over my head in one area because I want to ask, was, uh, was Jesus a socialist? Was the early church socialist? Uh, is socialism... Uh, advocated by the Bible, and I'm not an econom- economist. See, I can't even say it. I'm not an economist, uh, and so uh, that's why we're going to talk to Jay Richards. But I do know the Bible, and so I want to give you a little bit of perspective on that. I want to look at three things in particular in the Bible and ask the question, does it support socialism? Now, why is this even significant? Why you know, get into something that many would view as political, um, well, it, it affects all of us, uh, no matter what country you live in. And if you're in Europe or well, any part of the world, socialism is probably even more a part of the discussion than in the United States. But I want to show you a poll that came out yesterday just to illustrate why it's uh, a, a thing today. Hi, Tammy. Chat is open. Appreciate you guys jumping in here. Hang with me a little bit here, okay? So we're going to look at three things. But first of all, look at this poll that came out yesterday. Uh, This is a CNN poll, and it has Bernie Sanders in first place ahead of Joe Biden, Elizabeth Warren, Pete Buttigieg, and Bloomberg. Okay, the rest of them. Why is that significant? Well, Bernie Sanders is not technically even a Democrat. He's running on the Democrat side, obviously. But he is an independent, uh, and he is a self-described socialist. Uh, and they will use phrases like democratic socialism, meaning that it's not socialism by force, but by election, such as you had in Venezuela. Now, don't don't let that put you off yet. Uh, I know Venezuela had lots of other problems, and we'll talk about that in a second. But here's my question, because for Christians, this is something that you're going to have to talk about in the next, between now and the election for sure, and possibly past that. So here's my question for you, if you're a Christian. Even if you're not, and you just are interested in socialism and stuff like that. Um, When Jesus told the rich, rich young ruler to sell everything he had and give it to the poor, was that an act of socialism? When the New Testament church sold all of their possessions... uh, and lived basically in a commune, was that a form of socialism? Is that the model that the Bible lays out for Christians today? And then we'll even go back to the Old Testament and look at the one of the 12 tribes of Israel, the Levites, who did not uh, have a means of producing wealth in their time. Um, and, and so if you want to look at it just as one of the 12 tribes, even though the numbers were not obviously evenly that way, but about 8% of the population was supported through, at the time, the tithes, okay? So taking money, redistributing wealth would be the argument if we were to say that that is an early example of socialism. I'm going to answer those questions from a biblical standpoint, but I'm going to start by looking at the economic side of it just so we have some knowledge, and this will arm you for the next year as a Christian, okay, just with understanding, no matter what side uh, hey, Tammy, I'm glad your husband's joining you today. Maybe this will interest him uh, a little bit because if if you're he's off today, meaning he's got a job, meaning he's probably having these conversations at work. So first question, before we answer whether socialism is advocated in the Bible, let's look at what socialism is. And this is where I go to Jay Richards, uh, an economist. Uh, he is the author of a book called Money, Greed, and God, which was just reissued um, because in the original one 10 years ago, they asked them to cut out all the stuff on socialism <laughs> because they thought, nobody in America is talking about that. Well, he was a little ahead of his time. Um, but 10 years later, we're definitely talking about socialism. As as we see, a uh, socialist candidate is now in the lead, at least in one CNN poll. And I don't put a lot of stock in the polls, but it is indicative that this is an idea that is catching on in our country. And obviously, it's been operative elsewhere. So, Does the Bible advocate socialism? Well, what is socialism? Is it helping each other? Is it taking care of the poor? Is it everyone paying their fair share? Who decides what fair is? 
Uh, let's go to an economist so he can explain. Okay, if you look it up in Merriam-Webster, it says socialism is an economic system uh, in which private property is abolished and the government owns the means of production. In other words, the government owns all the property, the factories, the land, uh, the farms, all that stuff. That's socialism. Okay, but that's not what we're talking about in the United States right now, exactly. Well, not is exactly. It? And so that's what's odd is that the word socialism has never been invoked in American politics until very recently. It was always a, considered a bad word. It's one of the few countries where you couldn't get a major socialist party, but in this kind of last few years, we have some national politicians talking about it. If you listen closely, they'll say, well, I don't, I don't support, of course, the kind of socialist revolutions you had in the Soviet Union. I support democratic socialism. Okay. And so the idea is that rather than having a violent revolution, you just have an election, right, in which right. you elect a politician who confiscates the means of production and sort of abolishes private property. But they don't say that. They're never yeah, going to yeah, say that. Nobody say no one is ever going to say that. Yeah, but if you notice, like, if, if you actually followed communist revolutions or socialist revolutions, nobody ever quite says that. Uh, but ultimately, if the government controls all the details of an economy, right, where you can live and what jobs you're going to do and how much you can be paid and how much you have to pay your employees. At some point, the government is controlling everything. It is effectively socialism. And this is so this is what happened in England after World War II. You had a labor government that came in. They nationalized, you know, a bunch of the industries. Uh, it was a disaster economically. And then under Margaret Thatcher, they had to unwind it. That's essentially what we're talking about. But I okay. assume that politicians are counting on most voters not remembering the Cold War and certainly not knowing what happened in England after World War II. Okay, so socialism is when the government um, owns your business. And if you go back and look at history, uh, you can see all the promises of the government taking care of its people through free things which aren't really free, and I think most people get that. Um, but they they haven't worked. Um, I, uh, one of our uh, Democrat Congress women recently said, "It's not free; it's the common good." And I actually think that's a fair point because you know we have common goods in any society. Um, but is that socialism? Uh, if you look back in history, it doesn't have a real good track record. And I think you could you could say you know why. Why has it not really worked? Um, has it done any any good? You know, we could debate that all day long. What I am here for is clarity on what socialism is, uh, and then to look at the um, scriptural side of things. Does the Bible advocate socialism in any form? And I was, I was going to pull that uh, definition back up on Merriam-Webster. Because I, I just think we need to be clear, because I think a lot of people, even those who are advocating it, they uh, advocate something that is not uh, actually technically true. Okay, so the Merriam-Webster definition. Oh, why do I have a cat? Sorry, <laughs> gotta love pop-ups. The, the 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 definition of a system or society or group living which there's no private property. Right, one part of it, and then the means of production are owned and controlled by the state. What is means of production? That's your business. Okay, so whatever you do to generate income that is owned and controlled by the state. Okay, so just for clarity's sake, when anyone wants to talk to you about socialism, make sure you're on the same page. We're talking about no private property and the government or the state, same thing, owns the means and production, uh, it owns your business. It owns your business and tells you what you can and can't do. So if you're a farmer, then you no longer own your farm, or a co-op doesn't own your farm. Um, even a big giant company, uh, you know, a, a food company or whatever, if I, looking at animals like Tyson Chicken doesn't own their chicken farms anymore. The government owns it, and they control it. That's not my opinion. That's what socialism actually is. Now, you want to modify it and do something else and call it something else, well, then that's what you're doing. But let's just be honest about what it is. Okay, how does this work? Back to economist Jay Richards, author of Money, Greed, and God. They're not saying that no. they want to go to 
full-fledged no, social. Not. They're just saying, okay, we need better health care. So they're saying, let's, what, nationalize? National, well, they're or, not, well, they, no, they're not going to say that. They'll say Medicare for all, right? right? Or they'll say well, college education is going to be free. How does that work? Well, it, 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 it's exactly the same thing. So the only way that can work, right, is if not everybody goes to college. So if I'm going to go to college, college is a scarce good, right? It costs money. You have to pay the professors <laughs> and rent, that. right? You Believe me. You know, you know, kids, and, and so how's that get paid, right? That's the question. Well, what it means is that somebody else is going to pay larger taxes, to yeah. pay for somebody else to go to right. college, which but is obviously the rich, unjust. The one percent. It's the one percent. But of course, if you were to actually tax the one percent and one hundred percent, you'd get a lot of money the first year, and then you'd comp there'd be none left. And so you have to tax the broad population. And so that's why, under these kind of democratic socialist regimes, you always get massive increases in, in income tax. You also get massive increases in unemployment, and you get massive unrest, like. Venezuela, if we want to talk about democratic right. socialism, right. that's the current example. That was not a, a violent revolution. That, that was socialism in the ballot box, and look what's happening. Okay, so now Venezuela, I get it. There was all sorts of corruption, but it is an example of democratic socialism because it, there wasn't a revolution. They went to the ballot box. They voted a socialist into power. He implemented socialist policies. Now, again, there was corruption so I, I concede that to anyone that says, well, they just didn't do it right. No, they didn't do it. They didn't do it all right. <laughs> but at the same time, let's just be very clear that, that Medicare for all means nationalized social uh, health care, rather, which is socialistic in nature. Uh, and it does mean you have to tax the citizens, starting with the rich, but you can't, you, you don't end with the rich. It, it just... You, everyone has to pay their fair share, whatever we decide fair is, which ends up being an awful lot. Um, here's here's the flip side of it. You know, we um, we we back on capitalism. We're going to talk about that uh, because capitalism. When, when there's corruption in capitalism, it's bad too. The, here, here, I'm going to present to you a common theme. That is, corruption is bad. Okay, and it doesn't matter where. Uh, so. You want to talk about corruption and socialism, corruption and capitalism, and throw the baby out with the bathwater, we got to be real careful because, you know, reality is that when uh, a person is rewarded for the fruits of their labor, they're motivated to work more. Um, and I'm not talking about slavery or indentured servitude. Those are also corrupt, okay? Let's all agree that those are wrong and those are corrupt. We're talking about keeping the fruits of your labor. When you keep the fruits of your labor, as a Christian, you are then told to share, to take care of the poor. You cannot deny that taking care of the poor is a, a central theme of the Old Testament and the New Testament. We must, as Christians, insist on taking care of the poor. Actually, we must, as Christians, take care of the of the poor, not insist that they are taken care of, but actually do it ourselves. Okay, so again, <laughs> I don't mean to start any arguments, Tammy. <laughs> Loretta, good to see you. JB, Christopher, glad you guys are here. Um, so let, we have clarity on what socialism is. The government owns the means of, productions, means of production, owns and controls the means of production. In other words, they own all, all the businesses. Tell you what you can and can't do. Um, there have been problems. The problems are usually rooted in corruption. I think we can all agree on that. There are problems in capitalism. Uh, capitalism has, has had corruption. There's problems with that. As Christians, uh, again, and I'm going to answer these questions. Did Jesus advocate socialism when he asked the rich young ruler to sell all of he, everything he owned and give it to the poor? Was the early church uh, sharing everything, selling everything he had, sharing everything in common, was that socialism? Was that the example for us today? And were, were the Levites, one of the tribes of Israel, who did not have jobs in a sense, they worked, but they were supported by the others through the tithes, are those scrip scriptural examples of socialism, and should we follow them today? Okay, well, let's get back to the idea of taking care of the poor, of sharing, because those are absolutely biblical. Back to Jay Richards, economist, author of Money, Greed, and God. 
sharing is a very good thing, but notice sharing is voluntary, right? If somebody takes my car, I have not shared my car with them, right? <laughs> it's just like, it's not hospitality. If I invite somebody into my house, it's one thing. If they come uninvited, right, it's breaking right. and entering. Right. Um, and so that's not what socialism is. Remember, socialism is when the government confiscates private property or controls private property. But what we know from the 20th century in particular is that the countries where people actually prosper, where wealth is created, where jobs are created, mm. where unemployment is very low, is places that have limited government, where the government's not doing everything, it's not controlling everything, it maintains the rule of law, it uh, is limited otherwise, then it allows people enterprise, it allows mm -hmm. them economic freedom, and when people are able to do that, they're able to create wealth for themselves and others. And so that's why if you go online, go to the Index of Economic Freedom every year, and just look at the list. It's all 180 countries that we have records for. The very top, you get countries like Hong Kong and Singapore. The United States is about number 14. As the most free. Yeah, the most free, mm -hmm. right? It's all the countries you'd expect, all the places you'd want to live, yeah. right, are the most right. free. And then go down the bottom and you get places like North Korea and right. Iraq and right. all the obvious places, right? Those are disasters. And so in some ways, that's one illustration. It shows you almost everything you need to know where you don't have economic freedom, you have poverty and degradation. You don't have everyone sort of sharing and loving each other. Okay. Sharing is good. Here's the key. Sharing is voluntary. Now, you could say that it is uh, compulsory under God's law, and I, I can go along with that. But you're, you're doing it in obedience to God, not uh, at the threat of uh, incarceration. Okay, so it's it, the, the government doesn't have a gun to you. God has his law over you if you want to go that route, that, that sharing is compulsory. I would argue that it's voluntary um, even for a Christian. Um, when we talk about the tithes, um, I, I, we, have a, <laughs> we have a weird culture when it comes to tithing because we base it on the Old Testament. But if you, if you look at the Old Testament, the tithes were 10% went to the temple, 10%, which, by the way, took care of the, the Levites, 8% uh, of the population that didn't have a means of producing wealth, means of production. Uh, they still worked. They worked very hard. Uh, and they had specific duties. All of the priests had things they had to do. They had to work. If you look at uh, the, the farmers having... Uh, God telling the farmers to leave the edges of the fields for the poor. Well, the, he didn't say, give some of your food to the poor. He said, leave the edges, which means the poor had to come out and do what? Work. New Testament says if you don't work, you don't eat. So let's get over the idea that uh, we should, that people shouldn't have to work. If you're able to work, you should have to work. Now, in fairness, in a socialistic society, I don't know any that have advocated not working. It's just that the government tells you what work to do, when to do it, how to do it. Because, again, back to the actual definition of socialism, look it up right there, Merriam-Webster. The government owns the means of production. Uh, they, it's owned and controlled by the state. Okay, so we, we know that work is required, both by the government and in, uh, in God's idea of things. You must work. So, what do you work under? Uh, socialism or capitalism? Well, capitalism has kind of a bad rap. And actually, I want to ask you this. Um, what word do you think of when I say capitalism? What image comes to mind? Well, Jay Richards addressed that. For me, it was always that monopoly character, right? It's the, the guy in the tuxedo. Yeah, right? Right. His name's Uncle Pennybags, incidentally, oh, right? Okay. That's the mental picture because the word capitalism, it's, it's not a great word. It's bad mental association. Th that's not what it's about. If you think about it, I mean, the human race has fallen. So there is greed everywhere. Greed is universal. And every culture, right, in primitive cultures and feudalist cultures and socialist cultures, there's plenty of greed. Yeah, so that's not unique to market economies, right? There's some economy. If you're a butcher, a brewer, a baker, as Adam Smith put it, right, and different than greed that's unique to market economies, what is it? Well, in order to succeed, in order to make a profit, you have to figure out how to 
meet the needs of your customers. You have to anticipate what people would want and need and then try to provide it for them at a mm -hmm. price and a quality they're willing to pay for and to do it better than your competitors. So in other words, in a market economy, even if you were greedy, right, but more often you're just trying to pay the rent and things like that, that channels you into meeting the needs of others. That's what you want an economic system to do. In a socialist system, you're not oriented toward the needs of your customers. You're oriented toward currying favor with the government regulators who are actually in control. It's a totally different set of incentives. Mm. That's funny. Several of you had the image of the monopoly, monopoly guy. <laughs> okay, so let's agree work is good. And then let's look at the system that, that is most uh, beneficial for workers uh, and for working. I think we can agree that freedom is good. Okay, slavery, bad. Indentured servitude, bad. Lack of opportunity, bad. Freedom, good. Now, if we disagree on that, you, we, you just skip to the end. Okay. Freedom, good. Work, good. A free market is a climate that encourages freedom, creativity, hard work, and you benefit from it. Now, at the same time, serving others, biblical, helping the poor, biblical. So how do we balance that when someone comes at us with the idea of socialism it was what actually helps the poor? Therefore, if you're a Christian, socialism is the way to go. And again, I'm going to answer these three questions. Uh, did Jesus advocate socialism when he told the rich young ruler to sell everything and give it to the poor? Was the early church, first century church, socialistic when they came together and sold out everything and shared everything in common? And was the Old Testament socialistic and, and with the Levites, the 8% of the population, roughly, that did not have a job, even though they worked, didn't have a means of, of income, and they were taken care of by the others on God's order, the tithes. Um, but let's address, let's address something that is very real in the world uh, and I think concerns all Christians because if you care about the poor, you should care about this. And that is the idea of inequality. When you listen to people talk a good game on socialism, they always talk about inequality as if the problem is that there's some people that are rich, right? As if, well, that guy's rich. But look, the fact that Bill Gates is rich is not a problem to me. I lived in Seattle for years, right? He didn't take his wealth. For me, he created wealth through a process of discovery and, and wealth creation. The problem is that some people are poor. That's honestly what animates me. That's why I wrote this book the first time, is because poverty is still a real problem. It's a particular kind of problem in the developed world, and it's a really serious problem in the still developing world, sure. obviously. Yeah. And so if we're concerned about that, don't focus on the fact that some people are rich and some people are poor. Focus on the fact that some people are poor and then say, okay, what do we need to do to help them? And what are the known conditions that societies need to implement, need to have, in order for a large number of people, large numbers of people to emerge from poverty? Okay. into wealth creation. That's the only question we should be focused on. Forget all this business about inequality. That's really just kind of a fancy way of coveting the wealth of others. All right. Now, ill-gotten gains, scripturally, are abhorrent to God. I think that's why we have a negative image sometimes of the idea of capitalism, because we do think of that mon monopoly character. We think of, um, I mean, I won't go into the whole history of Ireland, but, you know, the people that were given the land and that lorded it over the, the peasants and, and held them down, oppressed them, and treated them horribly. Um, but we, we can see this all over the world where the rich oppress the poor. That is absolutely wrong, abhorrent to God, and none of us will stand for it. But on the flip side of that, covetousness is wrong. I mean, we got the Ten Commandments. Interestingly, the Ten Commandments tell us not to steal meaning something belongs to someone else. And it even says, don't even think about taking that property of your neighbors. Don't covet. Don't even, don't even desire it. Okay? So when we say, well, we just need to take from the rich in order to give to the poor. Jesus told the rich young ruler to give everything he had to the poor. When we do that, it's a very fine line between caring for the poor, and coveting, and stealing. Here's the thing. Private property is absolutely biblical, 100% biblical. Don't steal, because it's their property, not yours. Don't even desire it. Don't covet, because it's your neighbor's property. 
not yours. Okay, now this creates a little bit of a problem with the idea of socialism, but still, um, we have a problem of poverty, and we need to address it. So how is the best way to address it? And, you know, here's the thing. Christians, for the most part, I mean, if they don't, they should, care about the poor. We care about taking care of poor people. I mean, that's right now we are in our, our Water for Life campaign. If you go to lifetoday.org slash live, you can, you can support what we do to at least give clean drinking water to people. You know, we've, we, we do mission feeding year-round. We feed people. We care for the poor. We provide medical services in several places uh, around the world. We care about the poor. We do something about the poor. That is a calling of God. Is that the same as socialism? I'll get back to my last three questions. Uh, I would just say that, that poverty is a problem. Inequality, not as much. Here's the thing. We should treat people the same. But complete equality economically is a myth, and there are, there are parables in the Bible about that. You know, Jesus wants you to take whatever he's given you and invest it wisely. Uh, and if, if you don't, it, you, it does not end well. You can go look up that, that parable if you want. So there's something bigger in Scripture than, than economic equality. It's just never going to happen. Um, so we should really get beyond that myth and say, okay, how do we address the actual problem of poverty? And not focus on the rich and taking from them, but focus on the poor and helping them, which is what we do around here. And again, I invite you to go to lifetoday.org slash live if you're interested in doing something good today. I'm going to go back to Jay, and then I'm going to answer my three questions from Scripture that I've been teasing you with for the last 28 minutes. Here's Jay Richards, author of Money, Greed, and God. Looking at solutions for poverty, because this is something we all care about. It really gets down to um, how we address it, and I will answer your question in just a second, Tammy. Here's Jay Richards. So basically, if you have got rule of law, so you have sort of low corruption and the government does what it's supposed to do, so mm -hmm. it prevents people from killing each other and stealing right. each other, right? And well, even to the other. point of some regulation? No, well, that, every law is a regulation, okay. right? Okay. And so if, I'm not, if you're not allowed to kill someone, right, that regulates <laughs> okay. your behavior, <laughs> sure. right? And so sure. the question is, okay, but you want the government to be limited. It's not good at everything, right? So mm -hmm. it wants to be, you want to be focused on the rule of law and then allow these other spheres, family, church, voluntary organizations, uh, charitable organizations mm -hmm. and businesses, a, 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 a sort of arena in which to thrive. So actually government's really, really important in this, but it has to be restrained so that you have a widespread economic freedom and then the health of all these institutions, the health of the family, the health of the church. Those are actually really important economic facts. And if you if you have a, a, the family that's destroyed, I mean, yeah. we know this, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Like in the United States, the number one predictor of childhood poverty is whether that child has a father in his home mm -hmm. or not, right? And so that's actually an economic thing. But so we actually know this. We know there's about 10 things you need in a society in order for that society to be able to create more and more wealth over time. If they don't have it, you're very unlikely to do that. The question is, how do we help countries that don't have that to get those things? How do you help a country that doesn't have property rights, for instance, yeah. to get that. Yeah. And then how do you help countries like the United States of America, which enjoy these things, but are constantly in danger of forgetting them? That's the yeah. kind of two big questions. Yeah. All right. We need to look at the real solutions for poverty. Uh, and Jay is so right. I've been in some of the poorest countries in the world. And the breakdown of the family, the breakdown of the church, uh, those, those institutions need to be healthy in order for people to come out of poverty. And it's not an overnight solution. Uh, it's a process. Um, regulations, laws, obviously are good when limited. We need some laws, clearly. Um, but we really need to focus on how we can help the poor, if that's truly our concern. Here's what I would say to answer my three questions, and then, Tammy, I'll answer your specific question. Um, when you look at Jesus telling the rich young ruler to sell everything he had and give it to, and give it to the poor. He didn't tell ever, anyone else that that we know of, okay? So he didn't even tell his own disciples that. So to apply that to everyone would be a, an abuse of Scripture. 
But he also told the rich young ruler to sell everything he had and give it to the poor, not to the government, to, re uh, to redistribute to the poor. Imagine if uh, a, a Jeff Bezos or a Bill Gates went around giving all of their money to the, the poorest of people in the world or in the country, however you want to look at it, and said, I am doing this because Jesus told me to do it. What kind of impact would that have for the cause of Christ? It'll have an impact no matter who it is. If you do that, it would have an impact. Now, if you're like me, it wouldn't go near as far as those guys, the rich guys, okay? Uh, it wouldn't take me long to give away everything I had. I probably wouldn't even get outside of my county. Um, but if, 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 if in that scenario, uh, I don't, I think it, it, well, I know, it is an abuse of scripture to call that Jesus calling for a socialism, okay? But just try it. If someone wants to approach you with that argument, say, do it. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor in the name of Jesus, and see what happens. It does not advance the cause of socialism. It advances the kingdom of God. Number two, um, early church, uh, book of Acts. They sold everything. They came together. Now, a lot of Jews were coming into Jerusalem and that, at that time. They were coming to Christ. It was the, the beginning of the church, and they were living in a commune. I mean, I'm going to cough here just a second. Excuse me. They were living in a community, again, by choice. It was not by government fiat. They were willingly giving up their possessions to care for one another. That is never wrong. You can never willingly give up something of yours to care for someone in need and be out of line with Scripture. When someone compels you, to give up everything you have and give it to the government so the government can do whatever it wants with it, that is not the early church, 100% not the early church. And you know what, <laughs> oh, frankly, it grates on me, is when a non-Christian comes at Christians with these examples because I want to look at them and say, okay, you want to talk about the Old Testament and the Levites, 8% of the people, one of the 12 tribes, not actually having a means of production. Therefore, we had to pay a, a tithe, what we would call a tax in a sense today, to the governing authorities, if you want to call the, the, the church the governing authorities, which is fine. I don't know what the percentage is of Americans who are employed by a church full time, but I am totally cool giving 10% to a church to employ people to work for God full-time. No non-Christian that I've ever met will go along with that, but that is what the Old Testament model is. Now, and in the tithes, there's another 10% that, that went to take care of the poor. So 10% of your income in the Old Testament system of things, which, by the way, we do not live under the Old Testament law as Christians, okay? So let's just get that clear. But... 10% 10, 10 Jesus may not tell you to give 10% or 20% he may tell you to give 100% so it's about obedience it's not about math but again back to the Old Testament 10% to the church to take care of the church to, pray, to pay the priests to do their priestly duties okay cool totally cool with that 10% also another 10% so that the church could take care of the poor honestly I think a lot of churches are missing this in America. Now, I know some do a great job. My church has a food pantry. We're very com committed to this, and I know many other churches are as well. But here's my point. Charity belongs to the church and individuals, not the government, not, not a secular government especially. And nobody wants to live under a theocracy. I know non-Christians don't, and frankly... As a Christian, I don't either. I don't want the church, or I don't want the government deciding what, you know, religion I must be because give them time. They may start off just right. Give them time, they will screw it up every time. I don't want the government telling me what church to belong to or how I have to believe. I want them out of my faith entirely. That's what the original separation of church and state was about. It was a, a pastor writing to, I think, Thomas Jefferson, one of the early founder, founding fathers, saying, hey, how am I going to keep the government out of my church? You know, 
And the founding father wrote back and said, well, we will keep a wall of separation between the church and the state so that the government doesn't encroach on the church. That's been turned around. Um, generosity is demanded on a personal level scripturally. Compulsion is not compassion. Compulsion is not compassion. So back to that very original definition, I'll bring it up one last time. Socialism. It is a system, uh, a system or condition of society in which the means of production are owned and controlled by the state. The state. I will agree, maybe, I will have a discussion, let's say that, about socialism from a Christian perspective when everything is controlled by God. Not even a theocracy, a, a, a government in the name of God. Not interested in that because people will mess that up every time. But by God. And you know what? That's not going to happen on this earth in this era that we live in. So, in lieu of that, I do believe a free market is the best system uh, that allows wealth creation, which allows generosity on an individual and personal level. It only makes sense. The United States has been the most generous country in the world, in, in terms of volume especially, because why? We've created the most wealth in the world, historically, the last 200 years, 100 years, however long it's been. Um, the point being that with, and we've been one of the most free, we've been one of the freest economies in the world as well. When people are given a chance at freedom, at hard work, and at generosity, those are the conditions that set the stage for the kind of thing that Jesus advocates, taking care of the poor, taking care of your neighbor. So I hope this arms you a little bit for the next year or so as the idea of socialism is floated and scriptures are used uh, I just want to I just I want you to be able to have this discussion and it's real easy to feel like you're not qualified so remember freedom personal generosity compassion not compulsion voluntary sharing uh, and a free market those are the best things by far. If you want Jay Richards' book, Money, Greed, and God, you can go anywhere and get it. And I'm going to answer one particular question because Tammy asked it, and I enjoy feedback, even though I knew it. You know, I'm looking over here at the numbers of people that are watching live right now, and we'll see the replay numbers over the next 24, 48 hours especially. I knew that once I started talking about economics, the numbers would just tank. <laughs> it's just the way it is. But I felt like I should do it. Well, we won't do this. I'm not going to do this on a regular basis. But I just felt like it was important that we have some information from a Christian biblical perspective because people are cherry-picking verses to make a political argument, and I really hate that. On either side, even if I agree with the political argument, you've got to be really careful about cherry-picking Scripture. It's just not cool. It's not right. All right, Tammy asked a question. She said, I know it's a bit off topic, but my husband... Uh, wants to know why Bill Gates and Andrew Bezos, I think he means Jeff Bezos, uh, don't have to pay taxes. Uh, he said that even in Scripture, they had to pay their taxes. Agreed, yes, um, on the last part about Scripture. Um, I don't know, I don't think Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos don't pay taxes. I don't know, uh, 100%, but I, I think if you get into the weeds of it, you know, personal income tax, Corporate taxes. Now, a lot of times cities and states will give breaks for large corporations that come in. Um, capital gains taxes is probably what you're talking about. Uh, and there's tons of loopholes. And this gets into, bye, Loretta, see you next time. This gets into a lot of the, the real deep issues with a complicated tax code. Personally, I support a consumption tax and the abolition of an income tax. Um, even a flat tax would take care of a lot of these things uh, because what we, what we have is a tax system that has so many fingers in the pot uh, and so many special interests um, and so many competing voices that it's, it, 
I hate this time of year because I have to do my taxes. I do my own taxes. And I don't even make that much money, and I don't have a lot of other things going on. I got kids in college, so I have to account for that. But it's paying taxes shouldn't be hard, but it is. So we have a we have a jacked up tax system is the bottom line. So if those guys are getting around unjustly paying some of their taxes, it's because we have a jacked up tax system. It's not because uh, a free market economy is a problem. It's not even because wealth is a problem. It's because the tendency of human corruption sometimes and human self-interest all the time uh, gets into politics. Again, the more limited the government, the less of that kind of junk you have. The more government involvement you have. Can you imagine in a socialism, a socialistic society where the government controls the, the productions, the means of production and owns everything, what the special interests do? And that's why in these socialistic exper- experiments, uh, most recently, again, Venezuela, the corruption gets in there. And what's crazy is the people that advocate this are people who are typically not Christians. And then you go, well, what's going to keep you bound from corruption? You don't even ascribe to God's moral law. So you're making it up as you go along, or it's just a, a, a democratic vote, which can be mob rule. I mean, it's, it's just crazy. So you get the bottom line, limit the government as much as you can. Leave it free to the people. Yes, there will be some abuses here and there. That's the condition of mankind. But it enables enables godly people to do a heck of a lot more uh, in, in wealth creation, providing for themselves, providing for others, uh, helping the poor. It just, if you want to just really get deep into it, you can, but the studies are out there. So I hope that kind of answers the question on the tax thing. I, you're so in over my head, even though I've wrestled with taxes for years and tried to understand, I, I just... I just know it's so unbelievably complex for a simple person like me that I can't even imagine a big company like Amazon or Microsoft. A nightmare. Go to a consumption tax, get rid of that, but that's my two cents. Anyway, again, if you're still hanging around (laughs) talking about economics, God bless you. Um, But uh, above all, I want you to be armed from a scriptural perspective to be able to have a conversation uh, when it comes to socialism. Um, so, Tammy, I'm glad your husband got to join you today. Uh, come back later. Come back more if you can. Um, you know, watch on your phone on your lunch hour. If, I don't know where you're at, but it's my lunch hour. Um, and watch the replay. But thanks for hanging out. Please share this. Please share this. Uh, please subscribe if you haven't already, especially if you're on Twitch because I want to get those numbers up, uh, and come back again tomorrow. What do I have tomorrow? I don't know what I have tomorrow, frankly. I do know that I have a junk load of live interviews scheduled. Uh, next week, I think I'm four out of five days with live Skype guests, unless somebody cancels on me, and I've got a bunch of them. I just booked Mark Driscoll for a live uh, one of these chats. Uh a gentleman in Thailand who does some crazy, crazy stuff. Uh, and, uh, and I say crazy, I mean crazy awesome, not like goofy. Like, you're going to want to see that one. Um, anyway, it's getting fun around here, so please do share this. Please do come back. Here's all the places I'm at. Noon Central Time, that's Texas time, Chicago time. Uh, that's 6 p.m. in Ireland. And uh, figure out the rest there, UTC 1800. Thanks again for hanging out. This is Life. Today, live.